Welcome back, everybody. Um, I have to say, this, this is a conversation I've wanted to have for about 20 years. So uh, on our stage now is Alfredo. Excuse me, quiet, please. Um, Alfredo, probably the true godfather of Ibiza Balearic music. Welcome. Thank you very much. I think before we uh, start talking, I wanted to just get everybody into the spirit of things. We have the video to play. It's quite a long video, but we'll stop it when you feel like you've seen enough. <laughs> playing in the background but this on YouTube that keep the video playing if you can without the audio there's um, there's about six videos of this whole section from amnesia and I think it was 88 do you remember do you sure. remember any of this I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I mean people like me we you know you maybe see before maybe before yeah. you see old photos from Ibiza in the late 80s and you romanticize about what it must have been like and I'm too young to have been there. I missed it. I got here in about 1992. Um, but when did you come to Ibiza for the first time? How did your story begin? I arrived here in 1976, uh, coming from Argentina. Came here not for the music, and just to find a place to live. Uh, why, why Ibiza? I got some friends in here. They wrote me letters telling me that there was a paradise in this island. And uh, we've been looking for a place like that. We came to Europe in uh, autumn 76. It started to get cold in the peninsula. And we decided to take the boat that was in Barcelona, the ciudad of Ciudad de Ibiza. What did you see when you arrived? What, what did you see? Well, when we arrived, we found so many friends just getting out of the boat. Uh, freedom. Uh, everybody know each other by the first name. Nobody knew family names. They introduced me 50 people in half an hour, and, and I only knew the names. Is that why and you've always just been called Alfredo? Yeah. Wow. Ah, that. Um, when I choose, I never choose the name for to be a DJ. Most of the DJs in Ibiza were were called by the 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 name, no, no, not the family name. There was one this jockey in Pasha called Sisa, Maximo. <laughs> So when you, when you arrived here, who, who did you come here with? On your own or? Uh, with the mother of my first son, Jaime. And what was the first thing you did here? You met these 50 people, it was 1978, you said? September. Okay, and what, what did you do in Ibiza? What was, your, what was your way of living? How were you surviving here? In Ibiza, well, uh, okay, we came, I got some money. We, a little money, okay, we, we rent a house with no electricity or running water. After a while, before we've been living in a friend's house in La Peña, we rent this house in the countryside, we bought a car, and we start to make candles. <laughs> and, and how old were you at this point? Sorry? How old were you then? What was your age? 23. 23. 
So tell us about the next, you know, being 23 years of age in the 80s in Ibiza. At which point did you fall in love with music or get involved in nightlife on the island? Before I got in love with nightlife, a lot of things happened. First, Jaime was born in 77. Those, then, for those who don't know, Jaime is a up and coming, well, more than up and coming, quite established DJ on the island now, and often they play together. Yeah. Um, we start to run in the, the, the candles, but never worked so well. <laughs> we went to the market in Las Dalias, and after, no Las, Las Dalias, Escana, and uh, was very sunny and hot, and the candles, <laughs> Melted. <laughs> um, we went bankrupt in that thing. After that, uh, we got a shop that was very successful the first year. Then I keep carry on with the shop, start to become a fashion designer, and went bankrupt again. <laughs> uh, then. Um, I made tart um, cakes that was good. Thanks to uh, Jaime's mother that teach me the receipt. Uh, I've been selling in the shops and I started to play rugby. That I used to play rugby in Argentina. I played rugby for two or three years and uh, at the end of one season, somebody offered me to be um, a bartender in a pub in the harbor called Bebop. And um, I came into the bar, the, this guy went to Thailand, left me the key and said me, look, help my ex-girlfriend to run the, the, the bar. I saw you playing rugby and I think you, you are the perfect person. I don't know why. I start to serve the drinks and I discovered that there was two turntables and a mixer and a huge collection of records. Um, when I first touched them, the, I used to love music from the age of one, <laughs> probably. Um, I touched the mixer and discovered that you can mix men you can play one record after the other one and become and make your own music or your own sound that was my record for me and uh, and that moment i said i i wanted to become a dj i just want this becoming my, my way of life and were there other other lots of other people djing on the island at this time Juan suarez from Diario de Ibiza today. In San Antonio. Yeah. But San Antonio for the people from Ibiza was like um, okay. the forbidden land. <laughs> you, you were Ibiza town, right? Yeah, yeah, we live in Ibiza. Ibiza was divided by San, the, the mountains in San Rafael. Right. Nothing's changed then between San Antonio and Ibiza by the sounds of it. No much, <laughs> but it's much more connections. So, so where was the first place that you DJed in this bar? I played in that bar yeah. one winter, that was the winter of 82, and the winter of 83, and uh, after the winter of 83, I, wa I offered me as a DJ in Amnesia, and they never want me. <laughs> <laughs> They've been running by French people, and they work only French people and, at the club. But were you, were you going to Amnesia to enjoy it yourself? I, I used to go to Amnesia to enjoy myself. Was the, I choose, I, when I choose to be a DJ, I said, I want to become a DJ and I want to play in Amnesia. Right. That, that was, was the club on the island to play? No, it was the alternative club. It was the less popular club. The most popular were um, Pasha and Glories. And I think in 79 or 80, Ku opened, the, the club that now is privileged. Yeah. 
and uh, I choose it because my friends used to go to Amnesia and uh, it used to be a house and you can see there was a house with his garden, the architecture that mm, transformed the house in a club, respect all the parts of the house and in the place where the wheel was, uh, before you can s you, you you saw um, a pyramid surrounded by water, and then he chose that place for the pyramids and the water because there was the wheel of the house in there. So, what was the you know you were in your twenties going to amnesia? What was the sort of spirit of the island? Tell people in this room what you can really remember from those times, how you felt, how crazy it was. Just give us a feel um, for it. Amnesia, to tell you the truth, was a very cool place. Uh, they used to have um, live music. I've seen the special madness, Fanboy 3, Joe Jackson, or the, the underground musicians at the times and there was food to eat, running manzaniasis. Um, the music that was played was more tending to rock and pop music from the times. And where did you, tell us how you then became, you know, you put yourself into the middle of these DJs and the clubs, and you started to really become the guy here, you know, the... the uh, that was something that happened without me trying to do it. Uh, when I started working in Amnesia, that's, that was 84, the year after, uh, they changed ownership in the club, and the Spanish guy that ran the club accepted me. And for six months, I've been playing music for nobody. Right. Or about four months. We opened in April, imagine. Wow. The, new, the new owner never got a clue idea about how was the visa. There was nobody, it was very cold, freezing. <laughs> <laughs> and um, till somebody told me, <coughs> a woman, Mm, uh, my girlfriend at the times to play music uh, during the time that they've been making the accounts to pay us. Right. I used to get 5,000 pesetas a night. How so much? 5,000. 5, that is that like 30 best? euros, right. maybe. Um, okay, I start to play music for the workers. Moments in Love, E2, E4, Marvin Gaye. And the people that came down from Privilege, who at the times listened, because you, you could listen to music from the road, and uh, started to come into the club. And in 10 days, I can imagine 10 days, I remember, uh, we got the discotheque packed of people, and packed of people, not normal people, real nightlife people, were the last one, were the people that work in the other clubs, were the ones that lasted till the end, and was very cosmopolitan. Um, I think it's a difference between that times and now. There were no English parties or French parties or Italian, Italian yeah. or yeah. whatever. There was people from everywhere. The age was from 18 till 50. Yeah. The color of the skin was every color. The people came from everywhere in the world. And to make them dance, you have to tell them a story. 
I got an incredible chance to, to create my sound because I, I start from zero. And even the VPM was nearly zero. <laughs> and uh, I could go up and down during the night. I'm talking already at the end of 84 when the, the club became trendy. And uh, I could make music really for a dance floor that was packed and really happy. Um, there were drugs, obviously, and alcohol, like all the time in history. But nobody went prepared with all the pockets. I got two grams of this and three pills and marijuana or whatever. There, there was the chance to find something or not. Yeah. And I would love to think that the music was very important. Yeah. And I think it was. How, um, like it is now. How many, so tell, talk me through the typical night there. How many hours would you play for in the mid 80s? I used to play 12 hours. 12 hours. And you'd start at what time? Every day. <laughs> wow. wow. And what, what time would you begin? Okay, when we realized that the, the club was full up from three o'clock in the morning, we start to open at three o'clock in the morning. Okay, and it just went till three o'clock the next day? Yeah, till the other owners of the other clubs start to realize that <laughs> they've been losing business and start to send us the police. Wow, nothing's changed in Ibiza. No. <laughs> Um, Not that I mean, way. How, I mean, how, how hedonistic, I mean, we hear the stories of what a beat was like. Of people shagging in the dance floor. <laughs> <laughs> no, I never saw anybody. I don't believe Maybe you. they'd done it in a corner or somewhere, you know, but I think it's a lot of hype about that. Um, there was love in the air, <laughs> obviously. There was people meeting there, mm. like in every club now. There was not so much security, there was no cameras, uh, photographers, mm. private areas, uh, drinks were cheap, uh, you come and sit wherever you wanted. It was a really land of the freedom mm. and obviously the people enjoy it to the max. Yeah. And how, how long was your kind of reign there? How many years were you playing for 12 hours every night? A hundred. <laughs> <laughs> exactly a hundred. Uh, sorry, how do you mean? A hundred days. Ah, a hundred days, okay. But how many years, how many summers did you play? All right, I, I played in Amnesia from 84 to 89. I think there was six years. 84, 85, 86 was the same. Uh, then space opened and we started to cut down the length of our nights. Okay. Because we have to give space to space. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, we started to start to close at nine, mm. then at eight, then at seven, yeah. and it was a bit of... And when did you see things start to change a little? When did you feel that people from, uh, maybe from the UK, I mean, the, the British get blamed a lot for ruining Ibiza. Um, you know, when I, I'm British, I would say we helped Ibiza, but some people would disagree. But when did you start to see, you know, these, these new people from London coming in? I'm going to tell you something that I don't know if I have to tell you, you being English. <laughs> um, the moment that English people was part of the, sea, of the dance floor and was not majority, was the best part of Amnesia. In the times that 
English people became a majority. I had to change my music, press by the, the, the dance floor. I could not play any more Italian or South American music or French mm. or Spanish. I keep doing it, but I never got the same feedback from the people. And uh, I discovered that, or I, ne I never discovered, I, I, have to, I used to make tapes and sell yeah. tapes. It's like I am in my life at times. <laughs> Tapes <laughs> everywhere. And I made a tape to Jose Padilla, m m m many tapes to him, that he used to sell it in San Antonio. And that was the way that the people from San Antonio start to come to Amnesia. And I think if Amnesia did something was to mm, unify the island in one place. I think Amnesia was the only club in the island at the times that got people from San Antonio and from Ibiza. Yeah. And they socialize and get friendly. And people from San Antonio, English, 100%, nearly, became to go to Ibiza through amnesia. Yeah. And when did, you, when did you get the feeling that your name was becoming talked about in, in, the, in the UK, for instance, in the media? And yes, somebody bring me a newspaper, The Independent, and I, there was a note in the front page saying that a new style of music... All right, the girl, a friend of yours, Nancy Noyce, explain me. I never speak, speak English at the time, spoke English. I, I don't do it very well at the moment. <laughs> but I couldn't say a word that time. And they, they showed me that uh, I became in popular in England. And for me it was, wow, what is happening? Why? I couldn't believe it. And that was 86, 87. Mm. My memory got l all right. You're doing pretty the, good, the, actually. <laughs> they used, the club used to call it amnesia, no? <laughs> I, I got some of them. <laughs> and at which, um, did you ever, at that time, get asked to go and DJ in another country? Yeah, in Italy first, um, in Spain first. Okay. First place I used to go was Barcelona to a place that was full of Barcelona football club players. <laughs> uh, then I went to Madrid, some people from the club that uh, got <coughs> bars on the club, got a place in, San, in Madrid and they opened an amnesia in Madrid. And I've been DJing there for two winters Till I saw snow <laughs> in the day, in the spring day, and I started to cry. <laughs> and I said, what I'm doing here? I have to go back to Ibiza right now. <laughs> and the owner said to me, no, we had, was very successful in the club, was yeah. full of people, best people in Madrid. <laughs> and I've been earning a lot of money. But I said, no, I have to go. Tomorrow I take my, my car, my records, mm. and I left. Wow. Wow. And then um, I went to Italy a lot. They invited me to play in the Adriatic coast and in Milano. Yeah. Uh, there was one guy that started to work with me called Leo Mas that became a DJ actor and he's still working a lot and very well. And I used to go to his house and we used to buy records in warehouses in Milano. And I played quite a lot in Italy, 
before going to play in Germany, looking for Jaime that was living in Germany, playing Germany, in Switzerland, and mostly in Italy. And you, you, you mentioned earlier playing records like E2, E4 back in that time. Where were you finding your music? Where were you going to find your music? That's another thing. I couldn't go to England to buy records. Then I had to buy records in warehouses in Italy, uh, an import record shop in Zurich, and in Dusseldorf. And I found most of the typical and famous Balearic songs in that places. That's why for England, the music was unknown and so fantastic for them. Uh, they, they couldn't buy that records. So Amnesia, it's 1988, the British, you know, the magical fairy tale story of Paul Oakenfold, Danny Rampling and um, Ian, Ian St. John. Um, and one of the skipping through amnesia, holding hands, which is the famous story we're all led to believe. Um, how were you aware of these people in no. the club? You didn't ever connect with them, or I've been aware of Nancy that yeah. came with them. I think Nancy came one year before and told them. Nancy introduced me to them, but it was a very short uh, conversation or. I've been really into the dance floor, and uh, I never, um, never got time, or never saw the with who I've been. I've been talking. Uh, I've been talking to young people from everywhere. In between them, there was these guys, but I never connect them with music. They never told me. Yeah, they told me we are DJs. Uh, not Danny, because Danny wasn't a DJ, but Paul told me, and uh, Johnny Walker, if you remember. And uh, Nicky Holloway. When you, when you see the stories of the history of Ibiza from that time, you know, they get repeated, as stories get changed over time and history. How do you feel that history reflects what really happened? Do you think the history of those guys coming here and your involvement is, is fair? Do you feel that you've been given the respect from that time? No, in a way. They make, give me the possibility to get more famous in England. But at the same time, to tell you the truth, they, they took from me the music they put a name on that. They, how you say, they classify the music uh, to, to, I, f I felt like they took my music and they put a name to my music. It was funny. I, I, when I went to work in London, Everybody got my records. Yeah. When I have to play in London, I have to, well, I'm going to play. They play the, the one that was before me. They play everything. <laughs> I play. How did you feel about that? I'm not very happy. <laughs> did you tell them? N no, they've been paying me <laughs> to go there. I could, yeah, I said to someone, some, some commentary saying that I did. But they said to me, yeah, but we love this music, we love this music. And so you don't feel, when you say... I never owned the music, by the way. You never what? Owned yeah. the music. Yeah. But do you feel, I mean, you feel they, like for me, knowing those guys, they did, they did take it back to Britain with a complete passion. It was nothing but they were completely taken in by what you did and seduced by how you played. And no, I got... I got some stories about one day Danny Rampling, I went to his house. He already got a club and a followers and he was well known. And he said to me, 
And you know, Alfredo, in the minute 32 of the tape number 12 in 86, which record you play? And I say, what? <laughs> You've been listening to all the tapes. I've been listening to all the tapes, all the mixing. I know the tapes from minute one to minute 60 or 90. They knew the way I mix in the, the records, and they've been mixing the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Was in a way was I feel proud, and I say, "Wow, they they, they copy me." Yeah. So did they? Did you become good friends with them? Did you become? Did you feel they were giving you support? With some of them I became friends with. Nicky Holloway, I got a long story <laughs> <laughs> with. Um, Danny also, mostly with Nancy, right. and Johnny Walker also. Yeah. And how 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 crazy were these times? You said you used to party quite a lot, right? For me, it was very crazy times. Uh, <laughs> I don't regret, but I advise people. Um, Playing seven days a week is impossible yeah. without taking something. It's what I thought in that times. If it would happen to me again, just a dream, I would take much more care. Yeah. So, I mean, how under the influence were you? Um, Okay, I, I don't think we influence the music because the music I bought it before and very clear yeah. without taking drugs when I've been, and then I've been using it. I think when I was out of my brain, the music went out, out of sight, yeah. definitely. <laughs> mm. I cannot say that helps much. <laughs> But was the whole was the whole island kind of like everyone in amnesia till three o'clock? I think we all know what kind of what was going on. But was there after parties all the time? Was the island just a complete crazy no. place? No, because amnesia finished at two yeah. in the afternoon. The only way out was the beach, and in the beach there was no music. It was fantastic. After twelve hours, for me, it was a dream. Just 12 hours of music and go to the beach and listen to the birds and the sea and take a bath and no boom, boom, boom at all. <laughs> at all. There was silence. And that was what most of the people was looking for, silence. Wow. And tell me, tell me when things changed or how, why did you leave Amnesia? What, what sparked you moving? You went to Pasha next time? I think I got big head headed my ego went mm, bigger than supposed to be yours mine mine one yeah and also uh, the owners uh, wanted to get me more more power in the club yeah. and the manager said no that's not good for me and uh, during a winter that was the winter of 89 and I was working in London, I received this sack by telephone <laughs> and it was a, a drama for me completely. Who, who sacked you? Huh? Who was it who sacked you? The manager, right. without the owners knowing. No, no, no. So what, hap what happened next? Uh, my friend that was my uh, right hand in the club, an Ivisenko guy, connect me with Pasha. And I, um, they came to see me in London. I was playing in, uh, in Nicky Holloway's bar. Yeah, the milk bar. The milk yeah. bar for Danny Rampling. Uh, sex, sexy, I think was the name of the... Sexy. Pure yeah. sex. Yeah. Yeah. So. Needs, you might know. Pure sexy, yeah. And they offered me loads of money and a bar to rent, uh, to run, and, 
I decided, I, okay, I accept it, and I went to play it for passion. I came in here in May, I started to play, it was full till the day amnesia opened. And when amnesia opened, I suppose I still live in Santa Gertrudis. That was the house I used to rent for the summer and to be near Amnesia. And I couldn't do the same road every night because I couldn't even listen in that Amnesia was open. <laughs> and I make it way around to don't, <laughs> to don't pass by Amnesia. It was completely wow. forbidden for me. And did you, how was Pasha? Did you enjoy it or it would just well, never felt? Pasha at the beginning was a pain in the ass. <laughs> A terrible, terrible situation for me. Right. But till the, the owner came and said to me, look, we brought you because we want the same you had in Amnesia. We, we want it here. We want the people drinking till 8 in the morning. We want the people dancing till 8 in the morning. Then we want to do whatever you want to, to have that. And we succeed. At the end of, nine, of the 90s, English people, that was um, most of the customers at the time, Ricardo, the owner of Pasha, said me, we won the English here. And we got Nicky having his milk bar in Pasha. And uh, at the end of the summer, um, Adamski came to play in, uh, in Privilege, and I called him and said, look, why you don't come and play in Pasha after? Oh, right, super, we, we're going to repeat the one in Amnesia. And he came to play. The place was absolutely packed. And his first note was bang, and he blow half of the system <laughs> and we went on with half of the system wow. for six hours between <laughs> he was he was playing the keyboards and I been playing the, the music wow. Wow. and that was the night that we broke the supremacy of amnesia in the late hours well so from that weekend things changed yeah, and even before, mm. even before. By this, but September, we got the same amount of more people than Amnesia in Pasha. Mm. So where did, the, where did your story go from there? So we're now, where are we now, 1989, 1990? 1990. Yeah. Tell us about your journey from that point. We're now at the point where the media are really focusing on Ibiza and more and more tourists are coming for clubbing. How did it change for you? Mm, not much the first, the first years. Uh, I've been doing in Pasha nearly the same thing I've been doing in Amnesia. I've been working very long hours, from one till seven every day. A much more harder um, work than in Amnesia because you, uh, Pasha is, is different. Uh, the people change every week. Every week the tourism change in Ibiza. Most of the people come, used to come from seven days, 15 days. And you have to keep playing the same music because uh, uh, the, the, there is no way out of this machine. And then uh, it was not open air was crowd, crowdy, like impossible to move. I, I wanted to go to the toilet one day and I have to walk over the people, walk over the shoulders of the people and, and nobody realized I've been doing that. <laughs> Make 20 meters walking over the people and jumping back again, walking and to the DJ booth. <laughs> I saw, saw millions of tapes, <laughs> yeah. not millions, but a lot. Jaime helped me a lot, yeah. but a much more commercial way than I have. I used to give it away. <laughs> he said to me, no, we're going to do 30 tonight. <laughs> How old was Jaime at this point? 16. Wow. 
Uh, and I'm going to sell it. But I'm not going to sell it for 1,000 like you sell it. We're going to sell it for 3,000. And I said, no, what are you going to do? <laughs> We're not going to sell one. He sold every one, every night. Wow. So then, you know, really the, you know, people like me arrived, I suppose, um, 92, 93, and I was a journalist at the time, 17, and all I wanted to do was go back to England and tell the whole world about buying tapes at Café Del Mar and what I was experiencing. And, and really then, you know, the media generally and the English clubs kind of moved in and things changed, everything changed on the island. Tell us how you felt in this period, because we, we felt you guys were very angry <laughs> and very unhappy. No, I got uh, private situations that um, moved my life a lot. Uh, my father died, I have to go, have to, go to Argentina in 92 in the middle of the summer in August, a very dark situation in Argentina, came back and even if the trip was one week, when I came back, I, they moved, they've been moving my floor, <laughs> they said in Spanish. And uh, I knew that that was, that would be my last year. In 93, I, I took a break and I went to England to play. I've been dating a, a lady in England, and I, I stood in England. Okay. Were you not playing? very happy, yeah, <laughs> I play every week, yeah. but not very happy, to tell you the truth. I've been missing so much, Ibiza, mm. so much. And um, I think at that time, the first change were promoters, not the media, what I felt wasn't the media, it was the promoters. Yeah. The promoters came with 20 DJs for every club, got a night that uh, in that night the resident couldn't play. Yeah. And that night became two nights, three nights, four nights a week, mm. or five nights a week. And then every night was uh, like now. And then the room for resident DJs was very, very small. And I started to work for a promoter. Okay, who was that? Manu Mission. Okay, of course. Moved to this point. Yeah, but it was fun. Yeah. It was the most... Craziest time on the island. Yeah, it was really, it was like coming back to amnesia. Was much more people. We used to have nearly 12,000 12, yeah. payers by night. And how, you know, I mean, it's a, a different chapter we, we're in now, and, you know, hats off to Manumission. I'm not sure if some of them are in here, but, you know, they were one of the few British promoters that took care of the history and, and people like yourselves. Mm. And very few people were doing that, as, as you've described. So, you know, what. You know, what were the other guys? Cesar de Malero, I guess, was one I of I think they've point. been clever. They took care of me, like you say, but yeah. they took care of most, of a great majority of his public. Yeah. Because Manumission wasn't English. Yeah. It was from for all over the, the country, the, the island. Yeah. Everybody, a lot of Spanish people, Italian mm. and French and everything, yeah. everybody was in Manu Mission, and they, they said, okay, we're gonna get a DJ that is gonna get in touch with them. Yeah. Of, obviously, there was m m other English DJs on the roost on the, on the night, mm. but uh, they gave me a very central place. Yeah. So, and how many years were you doing Manu Mission for? That was 10 years, ten years. maybe. So post, post that era... I Best mean, part was carry on. Yeah, <laughs> space. Space, yeah. 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 It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's so much, so much to years to cover, and we're already 25 minutes over our deadline. I don't know if you may have read that Steve Angelo's not coming, which some of you might be happy about, some of you might not be. Um, 
I could sit here and talk to Alfredo for, for days, but I'm, I'm going to keep going. And if anybody wants to throw in some questions, please do, because I, I feel people want to want to want to hear from you. There's lots of arms going up, um, and we'll keep coming back and forth. But hello, can you say hey. your name and what company you're from? Oh, hi. Hey. Uh, I'm from Chicago. I'm with Function Recordings. Hey, Alfredo, how you doing? Um, I'm wondering, you're talking about, you know, you used to do 12-hour sets, seven days a week. And, uh, you know, we're living in a time now where you're lucky to get, like, a one-hour DJ set from someone. And on top of that, it's probably going to be one genre. So I'm just wondering, how do you feel about that, where it's at nowadays with DJing? Uh, do you feel like the need for longer sets and eclectic sets is something we should be doing, or...? I think the DJs now, they don't have the chance I got. And um, I feel sorry for them, most of them. Uh, I think to, to develop your, mu your music or your style, you need much more than one hour to create an, uh, an ambience, uh, to, to feel the feedback of the people, you need more than one hour. But obviously, uh, the things change, and uh, they need a lot of names on the poster. And is that the reason, I think, they had to play one hour? I don't, I don't think it's the best, but it's like this. I, I know people that reject to play uh, one hour. And other people that get more paid and the more su successful DJs. Before, oh, yeah. we, before we go to, is that Ian? I can see him. Um, just before, before your question, I just want to ask you very honestly, fast forward to 2014, your life, Ibiza, the island is unrecognizable from 19, the mid 80s. Tell us how you feel about the island right now. Uh, but the world changed, <coughs> your visa changed. You move on with the island or you, there's no way out. I think things have to change. It's much more people in the visa, living and coming. Much more money, much more industry, much more everything. Uh, I think um, it's natural that the, the change are natural as they are in every part of the world. I used to go to India in the 80s, 90s, and India was a poor country. India is not more a poor country, it's one of the powers in the world. But how do you, you feel about your position in the history and today? And, you know, let's be honest, you're not booked by a lot of the big parties here, you don't, you don't get a chance to do that. How do you feel about that? I think it's, uh, it's the life, man. You got ups and you got downs. You walk, walk to the top of the, the mountain and then you have to go down mm. the mountain. Keep respect of, your, of yourself is the, the way to do all. Oh, I, I have to say, on October the 4th last year, I had my 40th birthday in Ibiza, and there was one person that I could think of to play my birthday, and it was you. And he, Alfredo played five hours of probably the most beautiful, magical music I'd ever heard. And I was never there in 88, and to me it was a way to try and imagine what it would have been like. And I can tell you now, everyone who was at that party, from my mum through to young kids, were just like, who is this guy? I was like, that is the reason we're all here. You are the reason all of us are doing what we do. So Thank any promoters you. in this room, this guy still makes people dance like nobody else. So just thank you for that moment. Thank you. But, thank you. but I want to say something else about that exactly. There's many people that work for that that are unknown or never been uh, show as parts of it. I remember every doorman 
DJ, bartender, dancer that was working for me and they were with the same love and the same, um, they put everything they got to for Ibiza and Ibiza became what it is for all that people also. I think I am the, the face of them or they are inside me or they are behind me or beside me. Yeah, well, it's a spirit that you give off, you know, mm. a warmth that you give to people. Another question over here. He's been waiting very patiently. Hi, Alfredo. Uh, my name is Paul. I'm from Belgium. And Hello. Um, in, in Belgium, we've been looking in our music history since uh, last year. We had a film called The Sound of Belgium, going back to the new beat and, and way before. And uh, a name which is mentioned, and I don't know if you uh, uh, have any recollection about him, is a guy called Jean-Claude Maury, a Belgium guy yes. who spoke was very highly of you, and you used to work with him. I w was French. Yes, he was from Mirano in Brussels. Yeah. But was French, the guy, I wasn't young. Jim. I, uh, I think he's the person that influenced me more than anybody in the world. Jean-Claude. Fantastic to hear you say that. So, can we... Belgium's claim slightly a part of your <laughs> Balearic sound then, you know, put us on the map. Yeah, a revelation. But thank you, you know, it's, uh, I, I met Jean-Claude one time and he was really, was he was great, you. He was a great DJ. I think <clears throat> the eclectin eclectiness he got in his music was the thing that helped me a lot to develop my style of playing music. Great question, thank you. Another one over here. Hi, I'm Peter. Um, I just wonder what you thought about um, Kenneth Bayer doing his stuff at Cafe Mambo, you know, for Music for Dreams that he was doing last year. Whether that's more of an opening for the Balearic sound to come through and a bit more space for people like me and you that love that kind of stuff, rather than, you know, constant tech house that seems to be, as Seth Troxler said this morning, just swamping everything. I don't understand the uh, He was asking question. about Kenneth Baker, right? Who, yeah. who, to be fair, has been around the Balearic scene for a long, long time. Yeah, it's true. Kenneth Baker is was there all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all the time. I love Kenneth. It was just about, like, he did a thing last year with the Music for Dreams at Cafe Mambo. So I was just asking, do you think that is something that uh, maybe the clubs and bars should be making a bit more space for, like they did? Like, so, to try and let that sound come through a bit more. I think it's a good... Hello? Uh, it's a good chance to... for all of us to recreate the time and, uh, and play something different and do something different, yes, of course. I answer your question? <laughs> Mark? Hi there, Alfredo, it's Mark Jones from Wall of Sound. I want to say thank you so much for doing what you've done and how you've done it, but I have a question that I don't know how to put into words, but if you could describe the Balearic sound, what is it? Because I've tried so many times and I just can't do it. <laughs> How can you put Balearic, the Balearic sound into words, the Balearic beat? I can explain you what I've been playing. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot tell you what is a Balearic play. So I it think it's, it's, a way, it's a way to play music. And it's a feeling from within, because that's what I feel. Uh, with I've been Balearic. playing the music with a lot of feeling, a lot. I've been playing records, I love it, all of them. I hope that became Balearic. I was going to say that the one thing I always hold on to, for those who remember the TV show that inspired me to come to Ibiza, was a short film about chilling. And there's a quote in there where... I think it was one of the guys from 808 State said that Balearic and Ibiza, the beauty of it is it's a freedom in DJing. 
And that to me is kind of what you're describing. There were no limits, there were no barriers. It was a very different landscape to play music. And that, that's always stuck with me as to what was the lyric. Yeah, no, no music with a Spanish guitar and some bongos. <laughs> that's not. Okay, we'll do one more question, then I think we have to have to close. Anybody else? Hi, Alfredo. I'm from Boston. My name is Jordan. Hello. And I'd like to know how do you prepare yourself emotionally to hold a crowd for, let's say, a 12-hour set? <clears throat> I told you, I went to the beach. I ate a good plate of pasta. I sleep very well. And uh, I buy the records. I've been every time looking for some record, new, different, and uh, just that, just going to the club, taking care of my dog and my kid more than anybody <laughs> at the times. I got two now. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. The, the good news is that Alfredo is DJing tonight in Ibiza. The bad news is it's somebody's wedding, so we can't go. <laughs> Correct? <Yeah>. Correct. <laughs> Sorry, we can't, can't get you into that one. Um, so where, finally, where, people, can, where can people hear you play this summer? Is there any way you're going to play well, on the island? I'm going to play some dates in um, We Love. And I am in um, conversation with someone else that I cannot say it for another residency in the island. And some... Uh, some geek outs and around the, the world. Okay, well, I think I speak for everybody in this room. Thank you for all that you've done and for sharing it with us. Thank you.